recording now. Welcome everybody to the 13th talk on knot theory and today we're going to talk about a very mysterious object, the bicondyl and the birac, for which a lot needs to be learned. Anyway, so let's have a look. But before we get to that, now I hope you can see now, can you? Lecture 13? Yes. Good. Yeah. Yes. At last, the technology works. Okay, here's some papers to look at. Now, the first one is by um, Colin and Brian, Colin Rourke and Brian Sanderson, and they sketch out a proof of how you can do the classification theorem with um, uh, the fundamental rack, uh, provided you look at by two of the rack space <clears throat> and um, what they do is to look at its image in H2 uh, when the rack space is replaced by the three color rack and that turns out to be the integers mod 3, Z3 and the left-handed trefoil and the right-handed trefoil have opposite signs. So that distinguishes them. Whereas the actual, um, if you work out the equations of the fundamental quadrant or rack, you'll find that they're the same. Um, now the other paper I've got here is, uh, that's a, a paper by myself where I prove uh, something similar for the left and right-handed uh, trefoils using um, using bi biquandrels, which uh, which I obtained from the three three um, the three color quandrels. Anyway, they're all there to see if you want. And then the third paper is with uh, Stevie Budden and myself, so you can get a lot more details from there. Okay, biquandrels and biracks. Right, remember that quandrels, um, well, actually, they had two operations, of course. There was the, the ordinary one and its inverse, but, um, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to have four binary operations now. Um, an up operation, which I'll write like that, and a down operation, which I'll write like that. And we can also, there's lots of other notation. For instance, there's A wedge B, which we used before, and A V B, which is the down operation. And in each case, we think of B, the right-hand side, acting on the left-hand side. Right, right, acting on the left. And here's the picture. Um, so we've got a crossing, and now we have to distinguish. We have to have a, a right-handed crossing and a left-handed crossing. And um, so if we imagine that this is labeled A, as it goes under this overcrossing, it turns to A up B, where B is the label on this side. <coughs> B down A is the label on the left-hand side. And over here, it's the other way around. You can see what it is. And this is a positive crossing. This is a negative crossing. Some of you who've been here before might remember that the, the old notation used to put the action, used to be the B here and the B down A over here at the end of the arrow. <coughs> But um, it, it's more convenient to have it this way around. And I hope I've made the necessary adjustments in the uh, algebra. If you like, uh, if you think of uh, as this, as the orientation maybe being from, well, I don't know, it's, it's a normal orientation which, which makes that 
the better, better uh, sign. So, okay. And now we look at the following possible axioms. Axiom one, if we've got A in the labeling set, then A up A equals A down A. So that's axiom one. Axiom two, given A, B belong to X, there's a unique C such that A is C to the B, and there's a unique D such that A is D down B. Okay. And then axiom three, instead of one simple equation, we've got three of them. Okay. Um, and once again, uh, we use the up and down um, convention when we want to do it, uh, because it means that brackets can be avoided. And here's um, something like A, B, C, with, with the C directly under the B is ambiguous. I mean, what do you do? Do you do B first or C first? You see, it's, so you wouldn't use that, but you, you would have A up B and then C, but you could also do A down C and then up B, which would be different. Okay. Um, so a lot more uh, stuff than with the quandal or the rack. So, um, but if we if we put all the all the relation all the down operations trivial or the identity, then we reduce to the quandal axioms. You can check that. Okay. So let's look at the axiom in turn. So what do we have? Okay, so given, oh, we always start with axiom two because we want to look at the other two operations. Okay, given A and B in X, there's a unique C such that A equals C to the B. So write this unique C as a B bar, up B bar, okay? Or if you like, A wedge bar B. And similarly, the other one as a V bar B. Okay. And then these cancel out. Okay, so um, we have that. And how does that work? If we look at the Reitermeister 2 um, operation on <coughs> knot diagrams, we see why this is so. Right, and now what about axiom one? Well, this says that A to the A, A up A is A down A. Okay, and if you look carefully at this square, this crossing, A down A comes in and A up A goes out and they've got to be equal. Or, yeah, or if axiom one holds, okay, so that's why. Okay, now we look at axiom three, and we write them out in this, this way. The, those are the three axioms. And if we write them out in terms of wedges and Vs and so on, there's a certain sort of symmetry or dare I say beauty about these, I don't know. But anyway, that's what they all look like. And if you look at a cube, um, hello? Somebody is talking. Right. Okay. Maybe mute Sophia. Okay, can you mute yourselves, please? Hello, Sophia. Oh, it's Sophia, is it? Right. Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. How are Hello. you? Uh, very well. How is Greece? Well, um, I guess you're in Germany at the moment. Well, we are doing well. It's quite safe. Yeah. We are cautious. It's good. We are fine. Okay. Okay, going back to axiom three, if you look at the... Um, three sides of this cube here and you see how all the operations change 
you pick up these three axioms. For instance, if we look at the top here, so that's got to be the same as that. So A up B and then C down B, that's got to be the same as A up C, B up C, right? Um, and if you chase around here, you'll see why that's the case. If you look at here, the, back, the down things here, C, B, down B, down A, up B, it's the same as C, down A, B, down A. Okay, so it sort of switches around. Well then what about this character here? This is this something involving four uh, uh, places, four place relation. Um, well, you look at here, B down A and then up C down A. Well, that's because that is, um, why is that? That's because we've got BA down here and it goes underneath something labeled CA, so it becomes BACA. But on the other hand, if we look at BC here and drag it backwards, it's acted and bond by A up C. So B, so this is B, B up C down A up C. Okay, so that equation there. So that's, that's how we get all those relations. Okay, lots to do. Um, this is the diagram interpretation for Rademeister 3. A lot more complicated than in the case of the Quandl or Rack. This map, there's two maps. This is called the sideways map uh, from X cross X to itself. And uh, a rather more important one, the switch map from X cross X to X cross S is defined by S of B comma A up B is A comma B down A. <clears throat> now, if you want to do it so that everything here is unacted upon, X, Y, then it looks, uh, it doesn't look quite so nice. It's just Y up X bar and X down Y up X bar. Okay. But the important thing about S is it satisfies the set theoretic Yang-Baxter property, okay? Which is <clears throat> like, the, um, like the braid relation. S cross the identity, identity cross S, S cross the identity is identity cross S, S cross the identity, identity cross S, okay? So that is the, basically, that's the equation which we're, we would like to solve, okay? So, now, the fundamental quandle fails, okay? And so we have, well, <clears throat> Colin's paper with Brian shows how it's okay provided you use the rack space, but there's another way of looking at it. I free colored the um, right and the left hand trefoils with three colors, R, B, and G, and that doesn't distinguish them, unfortunately. However, I can color them with pairs of colors and that does um, distinguish them because it defines something in H2 of the space of, the, of this particular uh, biquandle. So um, uh, we've got details here, the doubled operations given by that. Anyway. Um, it's all in uh, my paper, which I've given a reference to. Okay, here's another example. Let's take a knot on the torus. So this is representing a torus. So we've got this side here, A1, A2, is identified with this side, A4, A3, and this side, A1, a4 is identified with this side, A2, A3, and we get a torus. And if you follow this round, you've got a curve on the torus, comes over to here, goes down to here, and then it goes back again to where it started. 
So that's simple close. Well, it's not a simple closed curve. It's a knot diagram on the torus. Okay. So why can't we have knot diagrams on a torus? We, why not? We've got knot diagrams on the plane. We might as well have knot diagrams on a torus. And uh, what do we do with them? Well, we've got still got the rider Meister moves. Um, so that would um, change the, um, that, that, in other words, if, if we looked at the fundamental quandle of this thing, then, um, then the axioms would hold the usual axioms for a quandle and also the axioms for a biquandle. So you could have a fundamental biquandle of this. Now let's look at the fundamental quandle. A to the B, so as we go through here, a gets acted upon by B and becomes A up B. But then that's the same as B. So we've got A up B equals B. And that implies that A equals B. Why is that? Well, if we're assuming it's a quandle, then B to the B bar is B. So if we act on this equation here by B bar, we get A equals B. On the other hand, well, and so that's just a, a trivial quandle, so that doesn't tell us that this is knotted. On the other hand, for the fundamental biquandle, we get this relation, which looks as though it might be better. Of course, that doesn't mean that it is so, but anyway, uh, if we try this um, Alexander biquandle, which says the down operation just multiplies A by S, so we're assuming it's a it's um, uh, an, an algebra in which we've got two operations, uh, S and T, which commute and act on the space here, uh, the space of labels. So S times A is the A down B, and B up A is the T acting on B, and then S minus T acting on A. Okay, and if you check, that is a bicondral. If you look, for instance, if you substitute B for A, or A for B, or whatever, you've got A to the A is SA, of course, just the same. And A to the A is now T times A plus S minus TA, so that's just SA again. Okay, so it is, it is a bi, well, then you have to check all the other operations, but we'll, we'll prove that later. Okay, and uh, so I've set this as an exercise, choose suitable values of ST, which shows that the biquandle above is non-trivial. You see, if, you, if S and T say are real, then you get, um, then you'll get a, 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 an affine, um, uh, an affine, uh, Operation on the plane, a uh, um, not a what is a, a, a skew? Um, what are they called when things fold over? Oh, anyway, it's it's an affine, um, a affine isomorphism of the plane. Well, linear, in fact, actually. So, um, and now question five, which might be a bit more difficult. So. With the um, with the the quandle and the rack, we've got a perfectly good uh, topological interpretation of the fundamental by a fundamental quandle and the fundamental rack. Perfectly good, and it, it's exactly the same as the the uh, the one using diagrams uh, as a, you know using the diagrams as uh, generators and relations. But, you know, what about this fundamental biquandle or birac? What is it? Okay, we can write it down in terms of generators and relations. But is there some other interpretation in a topological way or a geometric way? Okay, so I've been pondering that for years. But if anybody has an answer, I'd love to hear it. Right. There are many, many examples of biracks and biquandles. Okay. 
is one very simple one. As I say, this is a, a shear. That's the word I was thinking of. This is a shear of a plane, and it's an example. And it's an example when the switch map S is linear. Okay. R is a non-commutative, well, not necessarily non-commutative, but possibly non-commutative, but it is associative. And we write S as a two by two matrix where A, B, C, D are members of this, um, this R, this ring. Okay. And now if you work out what um, a, what the actions are, they're given by this formula here. Uh, okay. Uh, I did work that out. I don't think I've made a mistake, but you can have a look yourself. Then, then you look at the Yang-Baxter condition and you work out all the, what happens to these, you know, we've got three by three matrices and you equate the entries of the three by three matrices and you get all these equations okay which looks terribly difficult and something you might run away from but it works out very well um, in fact if you've got a and b are invertible non-commuting elements of a ring r suppose that a minus one is also invertible then the above equations reduce to one. Um, one, uh, you know, you look at the A, you, you eliminate C and D, which you can do, and you get one equation for A and B, which is given by this collection of um, commutators, right? So we've got one kind of commutator here, and another kind of commutator here, right? Um, so we're assuming that A and B are invertible. Of course they may not be, so that's only just one um, possible solution, but, um, but it's convenient and it gives a solution, right? So we call that the fundamental equation. And if we write it out without all the brackets and stuff, it is this. And C is given by this formula and D is given by this formula. Okay, so that's something. Can we find examples of these equations here? So let's have a look. And this is where our work with Steve Budden comes in. If we've got A and B commuting, well, we actually get the Alexander Bicondal for some scalars S and T. So it, the, um, the A and the B now become uh, T and S minus T. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Give a description of the ring described as the ring with two invertible generators A and B, which satisfies the fundamental equation, which is not as a presentation. Okay, all we know is that it's got two generators and one relation, which is fine as far as it goes. It's like saying a group is always defined by its, um, by its presentation. But of course, you know, a group has all sorts of different uh, descriptions, any particular group. And this particular ring here, what is it? Um, I, I don't know, that's, uh, so that's an, unanswered question. And here's another unanswered question, which I think is quite possible for those of you who are good at writing um, programs in C or something. So let, let's find some words, fixed words, U and V, in the free group on X and Y, so that X, y, X up Y is U, and Y down X is V. And then so that the resulting uh, operations here make a Birac or a Quandl. So this is just an experimental um, question. You just get the computer going and see what comes up. Okay, so there's a little problem, definitely a doable problem, I think. Um, 
it's been done in the case of the uh, rack and quandle, and uh, the two examples I gave are the only ones, apparently. I think somebody has proved that. So, you know, the, the up operation is just conjugation by y, and the down operation is just the trivial operation. It doesn't do anything. So, um, okay. So let's have a look for quaternions. The obvious, obvious ring which you want to look at, which is not, um, not commutative, is the quaternions. Okay, uh, and there's lots more, and we we will see another solution. So let's uh, let's recall what a quaternion is. Okay, we've got it's um, got four real parameters, alpha, x, y, and z. And then i squared is j squared equals k squared equals minus one, which is i, j, k. Okay, so that's um, apparently this is now a plaque on the bridge in Dublin where Hamilton discovered this. Uh, and I have to say discovered in inverted commas because Gauss had already done it, but he hadn't bothered to tell anybody. Okay, so we have to say it's due to Hamilton. Uh, if you don't publish, you can't expect to be um, given the, <clears throat> the naming of it. Okay, so let's say discovered by Hamilton in the 19th century. Then this alpha here is the temporal part. And this part here, x, y, z, is the spatial part. So this is just R3, and this is just a line. So it's R3 cross a line, it's four dimensional, and it's nice to write A as alpha plus boldface A, okay, which is here. And then we can do multiplication of quaternions. AB is given by this formula here. So this is the real part or the temporal part, alpha beta minus A dot B, that's the usual um, scalar product. And then beta times A and alpha times B. So that's, um, that's another part of the a spatial part, and then A cross B, which is the usual vector product for vectors in R3. And then we've got uh, conjugation of length and notated by this. So the length, the square of the length is A times A bar, which is alpha squared plus mod A squared, and so on. And the inverse is this. Conjugation by multiplication, all right, it's getting a bit more complicated now. Um, so it's this, well, so we look at B bar A B, so that's the important thing, and it works out to be that, so I invite you all to verify that that is true. And then the other commutator, A B minus B A, this is 2 A cross B, everything else cancels. So this is what's called a pure quaternion, because it's just uh, spatial, it doesn't have any temporal part. Um, and the other kind of commutator is a bit more complicated. Uh, oh, we've done that, haven't we? Uh, no, we haven't, no, that's just conjugation, sorry. Is quite a long thing here. Anyway, don't worry, it all comes out in the wash. We already know that um, we have one minus a is b d b inverse d inverse, but that means that the length of one minus a is one. So a lies on the three sphere, which is mod a minus one equals one. It's um, sphere of radius one and center one. So we want to exclude the poles in order two. And now the fundamental equation is that and then that reduces to this when we put in as quaternions. 
and using all the above formulae, we've got the left hand side is that and the right hand side is that. Right, now we're going to equate coefficients of a, b and a cross b. Well, that's assuming that a, b and a cross b are linearly independent, well, in fact, a, a triple, basis triple in space, which unless b is some real multiple of a will be the case. Okay, so that, uh, so we can do that and we get three equations. This, this and this and uh, and so we know that A lies on this sphere. The second equation is a conscript of the first. Equations one and three imply that A dot B, okay, the, um, that's a Euclidean scalar product of those two quaternions is alpha B plus A dot B equals naught. In other words, those quaternions are perpendicular in the four dimensional space. So we have that, um, and so this is our result. Then A and B are non-real quaternions. A cross B is not zero, so in other words, A is not a multiple of B. Then A, B are solutions of the fundamental equation if and only if this is true. In other words, that means that A lies on the sphere, center one, radius one, and a and B are perpendicular. Isn't that a neat result? I think so. I say it myself. Um, Very nice, Roger. Sorry? <laughs> Who was that? Who said that? <laughs> Dale. Oh, Dale. Oh, hi, Dale. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Yeah. Don't you think that's a neat solution? Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if, here's, a, here's something to remember in the future. If A and B is a solution, then so is A and then T B, where T is a real variable, okay? Because um, all we want is B to be perpendicular to A, and if, uh, if you multiply it by a real scalar, it's still gonna be perpendicular. So you've got a pro an option of making a polynomial with T, which we'll see later. Well, somebody suggested, and I thought it was, um, I can't remember who it was. Somebody suggested, why don't you look at generalized quaternions? I've never heard of generalized quaternions, but here they are. Take a field of characteristic not equal to two. Pick two non-zero elements, lambda and mu in F, and then this notation denotes the algebra of dimension four over f with basis one i j k and relations i squared is lambda j squared is mu and i j skew commutes so it's minus j i and that is k and then we look at what the multiplication table is and it's given by that um, matrix there so i times k is now lambda j now, if you put um, lambda equals mu equals minus one, you get the normal quaternions. Um, so this is a, a different possibility, all right? Uh, and we're only gonna consider this one case where lambda is minus one and mu is one. And then this is the algebra of two by two matrices, okay? And it's M2F, Entries in the matrix um, from elements of F uh, minus one one, or apparently it's the same as one one F. This is the only generalized quaternion algebra with zero divisors or non-zero isotropic elements. Okay, a non-zero two by two matrix A is called isotropic or degenerate if the determinant is zero and anisotropic otherwise. So only non-zero and isotropic matrices have ingresses, right? Okay, so the generators are together with the identity, the Pauli matrices, okay? So 
Um, I'm sure um, Lou would know these well. Right. And um, so we can write any, any two by two matrix as a linear combination of the identity and these three matrices. After all, two by two matrix has dimension four. Okay. Um, and this is a scalar matrix. Okay, and we'll confuse that with the actual element V. So let's denote two by two matrices by capital A, capital B, and so on. If the trace of a matrix is zero, then we denote it by the boldface lowercase a, b, etc. So that's the kind of this is the um, this is the analog of the spatial elements of a, of a normal quaternion. Okay, and any two by two matrix can be written uniquely as a naught plus this a here. So that's traceless, and a naught is either the trace or half the trace, I can't remember now. Um, so any traceless matrix can be written as a unique three-dimensional linear combination of the Pauli matrices. So the conjugate of A or the adjugate is A naught minus A. In symbols, well, we all know this from our university days or even earlier, you just interchange A and D and you take the minus sign of B and C. And the determinant A is A dipped up A bar. So it's a bit like the length, which we had for normal quaternions. And the trace, of course, is A plus A bar. Uh, because A plus A bar is now a scalar matrix. Conjugation. Sorry? You're off by a factor of two. Well, um, see, if you add those two, you get A plus D here and A plus D here. So the, the diagonal elements are the same. And if you remember, we decided that they were a confused scalar matrix with the corresponding two order element V. Okay. Conjugation is an anti-isomorphic order too. So it satisfies that and what have we got? A bar is A if and only if it is a scalar. A bar is minus A if and only if A has trace zero. The determinant is a scalar, satisfying that one. We know that. Um, you let an element A has an inverse only if uh, the term to A is not zero uh, and it belongs to this set of multiplicative subgroups of, of the field, um, which I guess is just, just the non-zero elements. I don't know why I've written that. Anyway, um, the trace with, uh, is twice its scalar part. So I guess this is what you were thinking of, um, Scott. Right. A general matrix can be written uniquely as this, okay, in terms of the Pauli matrices. And conversely, if you've got this in terms of Pauli matrices, it looks like this as a normal two by two matrix. Conjugation is this, and the determinant, which is usually alpha, delta, minus beta, gamma. If we work this out, um, this is a naught squared plus a one squared minus a two squared minus a three squared. So it's um, it's a, a quadratic form, but it's not positive definite. Scalar part is the trace of a divided by two. That's a naught <coughs> alpha plus delta over two, and the traceless part is given by this. Okay. Right. Now we've got this bilinear form, which a dot b, that's the scalar product of two two by two matrices, which is half the trace of a times b bar. 
and the quadratic form corresponding to that is the determinant of a, okay, which we saw earlier, and that's, as I say, it's not positive definite. And if we've got A and B be traceless two by two matrices, then AB is minus A dot B plus A cross B. So that's how we define A cross B. So this is the, um, the analog of the uh, cross product in R3, which is that. And we've got, still got a triple cross product expansion a cross B cross C is this, okay, which you remember from your school days. Um, and then a scalar triple product, which is this determinant as usual. Uh, so there's some formulas which give what happens. Okay, happens, happens. Ah, now, we will look for when can we say two by two matrices to be linear, sets of two by two to be, to be linear dependent? Okay, so here's one condition. A pair of traceless matrices AB is linearly dependent if and only if their cross product is zero. It's clear one way because of anti-symmetry. And if A cross B is zero, and then we cross it with another one and use the triple cross product expansion, we get this linear relationship here. So, um, so that's how we do that. Two, two by two matrices commute if and only if their traceless parts are linearly dependent. And then the traceless matrices A, B, A cross B are linearly dependent if and only if um, det A, det B is A dot B squared. This is equivalent to condition that A cross B is isotropic or zero. Um, and then and A B has non-zero determinant. On the other hand, if this has non-zero, if the, if the cross product of these two traceless matrices has non-zero determinant, then this triple A B, A cross B is linearly independent. So we, this is useful because we go, we're going to solve the fundamental equation for two by two matrices. Um, and in, in the commutative case, we get that. And that's how we get the Alexander by Quandle. So let's go to the non commutative case. And it's it, the, the same calculation exactly as we had before with ordinary determinants. And if we look, uh, so what are the conditions if these a, B, and non commuted to two by two matrices which satisfy debt A equals to the trace of A and A dot B equals naught, then they satisfy the fundamental equation. So exa that's exactly the analog of the result we had for normal quaternions. So we call matrices satisfying debt A equals the trace of A and A dot B equals naught matching solutions. Okay, so Notice that that condition only goes one way, because unlike in the uh, the classic quaternion uh, situation, we don't know they they may not be uh, linearly independent. You see, so we've got to look for um, uh, for conditions where they are linearly dependent, and I'll quickly go through this. Um, Well, have I sent you? I haven't, I haven't sent you my notes, have I? I will send them to you so you can have a look at the workings here. Uh, so uh, the, we've got a cone here, given where this is zero, and things which lie on this zero. C is isotropic, let A, B lie in this plane. Well, this is the Euclidean dot product equals naught. This plane meets the cone in the generator containing rho C. Rho is this involution here. And then this means that the triple A, B, A cross B is linearly dependent. Moreover, all examples are try to obtain this way. So we look at such triple, uh, triples and they've got to satisfy this relation um, here, the star. So we just juggle the 
uh, coefficients and we get a, a set of solutions. So that's what um, Steve and I did in our paper and uh, I've given the reference at the beginning. Okay, now we looked at surface knots. Well, sorry, we looked at a knot on a, a torus as a kind of um, something to get whet your appetites. So we've got um, an oriented compact closed surface. So S2 with G handles. Um, well, I haven't said it's connected, so I suppose it could be lots of S2s with G handles, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> I like to think of this, the S2 as, as the plane, so the plane of your table in front of you with a point at infinity, and on this plane there are a number of handles which go up and then back down again, okay? So let this be the closed interval. A surface knot with n components is represented, only a representative, I haven't said what else it is, by a smooth embedding of x in the interior of this three manifold, surface cross i, where x is a collection of n copies of the circle S1. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to think of as a surface knot representative. Okay, let k be a surface knot and let mk denote the free manifold exterior of k. And let's suppose the induced map from pi one of the boundary to pi one of the manifold has non-trivial kernel. Then by the loop theorem, which we discussed earlier, there's a properly embedded essential disk in sigma cross i, which avoids k. Doing surgery on this disk either reduces the genus G or increases the number of components of sigma. <coughs> and of course, if, um, if we can't split the knot, then one of, if, and if the, the number of, you've got a component which splits off, which doesn't contain anything of, the, of this knot, then uh, we can throw it away, okay. Uh, but I guess we, we, in full generality, it may be that you've got different components of sigma. We call, and anyway, this, this action uh, defines an equivalence relation, uh, which we call null surgery. So you can go backwards. You can take two disks in the, um, let's take two disks in the surface which are disjoint and, and uh, don't intersect the, 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 the sorry. What, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I'm adding a handle cross I um, to, the, um, to the surface which we got sigma cross I in such a way that um, the, the knot the, or the embedding is not is undisturbed. Okay, so that's that's the sort of the opposite uh, way of uh, of doing this this thing here, where we do uh, doing surgery. This is kind of like anti-surgery, if you like. And then, so an equivalence rate. So generally, by this, we'll call this null surgery for the sake of argument, and that consists of either cutting along the disc and plugging in two disks or the reverse. Okay. So we say that two embeddings represent the same surface knot if they are related by A, orientation preserving homeomorphisms and null surgery. Okay. In other words, if we got extra handles we don't want, we get rid of them. Okay, because we don't need them. And in fact, that's fine by a result of Cooperberg if K and L represent the same knot and the common surface sigma has minimal genus, then they are related by A above. In other words, if we know that two, two uh, representatives of the knot are, have uh, lie on surface cross I, surface same, same minimal genus, then to get from one to the other, you just need a homeomorphism. You don't need to add handles and then delete handles. 
So that's Cooperberg. So that gives you an idea. And now we can actually represent this surface knot by planar diagrams. And I'm going to quote Lou here, and I hope he doesn't mind. I think it's a wonderful quotation. Are you there, Lou? I've gone to sleep. <laughs> I'm here. You're here? <laughs> OK. So I got this from one of your papers. This sort of crossing is called virtual. It comes in only one flavor. You cannot switch over and under in a virtual crossing. However, the idea is not that a virtual crossing is just an ordinary graphical vertex. Rather, the idea is that the virtual crossing is not really there. OK, that's Lou. So we're going to take one of these surface knots and represent it by a planar diagram. This is a, a two-stage process. First of all, you project onto the surface, sigma cross i goes to sigma. <coughs> First map is a pro projection, and it produces a knot diagram on the surface, like we saw earlier on the torus. The second map pushes the handle into the plane. Okay, well, I'm assuming that there's only one plane involved. So you, you push that down, you flatten this handle, and what you get? Well, one thing you can always assume, you've got this belt here, this belt meridian, and um, you can, and of course there's, if you like, there's this arc here running across here. If you thicken this belt and then assume that all the curves on the, um, on the surface knot go uh, transversely across B, you can push out the boundary of a regular neighborhood of B all the way down to the plane. So everything goes off across nicely, like, you know, all the bits of the, of the curve go across nicely and the bits which come underneath they all go across nicely as well you push this down and what do we get we get a whole load of crossings so there are n arcs running cleanly over the handle and m arcs running cleanly beneath the handle then the push creates nm virtual crossings okay. so these are the virtual crossings they're like they're not like an ordinary crossing. They just, um, they've got a, they just a, a cross and there's a circle around them to say, this is a virtual crossing. So we can, um, and I should have done the torus, showed you how the torus converts into a, a, a virtual, a planar situation with virtual crossings. Uh, but I haven't, I'll do that in the next lecture. Also, what I've said is, that, of course, upstairs in the surface cross I, all sorts of things happen. It moves about. Um, what happens to these planar diagrams? Well, um, there are certain moves which you can do, and they're all the ones which are needed. And I will describe that next week. OK, I'll finish there. Um, are there any questions? Please send your notes for today. If you send them over to me, I will put them in the Dropbox and everybody oh, okay. can get them that way. Okay, Lou. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'll do that. Sorry, Colin, say something? No. No, did I do something? I don't know. Did you say something? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Nice lecture. Thank you. Is the... Uh, Maybe you or Colin knows, is pi two of the rack space related to the third quantal homology? Well, there is a, a natural map, isn't there, from the, which increases the dimension or decreases the dimension, I can't remember. Um, there's that funny... Because the quantal three co-cycle detects um, handedness of the trefoil. I think yeah. I've um, that from you people. Well, you probably know more about this than I do. 
I don't think so. <laughs> I think if you look at that paper that Roger signposted, uh, I think it's all in there in the calculations. Yeah. But I'm not sure. We certainly thought we were recovering your theorem about there are two right. different um, Yeah. Yeah, I should say that um, uh, the, that, uh, that Colin and Brian prove that the using um, quandles that the right hand trefoil and the left hand trefoil are distinct, and also the twist spun trefoil and okay. so on. Okay. Um, but th they were not the first people to do that. This was, uh, I think, some other. Did you, Scott? Did you prove that or? Or, or was it? Yeah, uh, Danny uh, Rubelman was the first person to show that the two twist spun trefoil was non invertible. That was part of his thesis when he was here. Yeah. We used the quandal co cycles to do it. And then uh, shortly thereafter, some among FRS uh, proved that the trefoils were handed using the same co cycle. Yeah. So you either use the was it a two-dimensional co-cycle or three-dimensional? Three. Three. Okay. Well, maybe it was a three-dimensional one. I can't remember. You can look at the paper. I have to read it now. <laughs> been been quite some time ago. <laughs> yeah. I know. I We're all a, getting old. I, I was recently sent a, sent a paper to review where they, they talked about welded being recent. 25 years ago, we produced welded stuff. <laughs> Hi, Sam. I have a question for Lou. How, how do we access your Dropbox? Um, there's a code. I've sent it many times. I can send it to you again. If you send, well, send it, I don't have the list. I don't have a complete list of no, no, everybody. No, no, no. If you send it to me, I will send it to everyone. Is that okay? I have sent it to you before, so you have it. Oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll find I'll, it. I'll then. send. Yeah. I'll send it to you, Roger. Yeah. Okay, that's typical of me. I'm sorry, but I will definitely do it. There should be a code for the code, so it would be three letters long or something. <laughs> <laughs> I've been pre uh, putting in a link from all the YouTube uh, videos. Been oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I know. Um, I'll put that code right at the top of my website. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, any more questions? Has anybody solved the questions I've asked? <laughs> too much like hard work, Rod. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit. The weather's too good. <laughs> it's ridiculously hot. <laughs> yeah. What about the rest of the world? Is it just England? We're, we're having a, a, a heat wave at the moment with no rain. Mm. Okay. I'm going to stop recording now, unless there are any more questions. Nope.